Good morning and welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for joining uh, and spending your valuable morning with me here. Today's conversation is really continuation of a previous one in which we were talking about uh, early modern ship design. In this case, I would like to talk a little bit more about the techniques and probably in a separate video, I will film the actual process of how the shaping of a hull is done. We already discussed the fact that uh, all the stories of the ignoramuses and conservative and illiterate shipwrights are just hogwash. And it is, in fact, that they were highly educated, highly cultured, highly sophisticated men of their time. And uh, so today let's talk a little bit about something that we began in that previous conversation but never came to uh, complete it. How do you transfer the ideas of the master shipwright into the practical lines plan or the formation of the modes that will be used to shape the timbers of the vessel, which of course is the whole point of whole molding. In the early stages of the process, then maybe I should paraphrase, uh, preface this by pointing out that one of the questions that we are still discussing as uh, ship archaeologists and maritime historians is what was the purpose of the early treatises? How did this technique of hull molding really emerge? Was it conceived? as a way of designing a ship or was the early stage of it conceived as a way of recording an existing ship and passing on the knowledge of successful ship designs and that is a little bit like the question of what was first the chicken or the egg we can argue it back and forth ad nauseum so i would only like to acknowledge that this is one of the big questions in the field. I will not argue one way or the other. So let's talk to the point of how do you do it? The really important things was, of course, everything started with what are you building? What is the purpose of the ship? Are you building a fast sailing privateer? Are you building a warship? Are you building a merchant vessel that is supposed to carry huge quantities of cargo or a long distance trader, which also will have to have rather full ship in order to carry the provisions that will take you all the way to the East Indies without reprovisioning. That, of course, determines overall dimensions. Then once you have established the length of the vessel, from the length of the vessel is determined the maximum beam of the ship. And that could vary depending on what you're using the vessel for, depending who designs it, depending on many, many uh, different things. You determine what is the proportion of beam to length of the vessel. vessel. Uh, this is as good as any time to point out the obvious fact that different nations different, uh, had different methods of measuring ship. The Dutch, for example, measured it between the rabbits at the height of the stem the upper end of the stem and the upper uh, point of the stern post. So, roughly speaking, this is length between perpendiculars. The English, however, continued for most of the 17th century to measure only the length of keel. But just to make life more entertaining for us historians, uh, archaeologists, and frankly for you ship modelers, it should be pointed out that there were at least three different ways of measuring keel. It was touch, it was step of the keel, it was a keel all the way up to the point where the arc of the bow begins. So, before being able to determine what the measurement in the tables and in the list is actually telling you, you have to establish what type of measurement of length of keel they are using. As I said, nothing like the possibility of utter entertainment. 
Once you have established these parameters, the beam, the length of the vessel, the third one, of course, to follow is the depth in hold. And again, this is determined by the conditions in which the ship is expected to operate. But these are the three major parameters. Once you have the depth in hold, and of course you have to establish how is this measured in the time period and in the nation that you are studying. From these proportions follows everything else in the design of the vessel. The first thing that you, the next step, not the first thing, but the next step, once you have the beam of the vessel established, the next step is to establish the breadth of floor of the vessel. How wide is going to be the dead flat of your midship section? That can vary. What a surprise, right? What it can vary between is anywhere from uh, half the beam to three quarters of the beam or perhaps one third of the beam. That determines the narrower the floor timber, theoretically the faster the vessel would be because it will have the less displacement, the less wetted surface and therefore less resistance in the water. The wider the floor timber, the more cargo you can carry, the higher the displacement. And incidentally, something that experienced during the Anglo-Dutch Wars, particularly the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars, demonstrated is that the wider your floor, the more stable a gun platform your ship becomes. That became important later in the 17th century. And of course, continued into later periods. How ships carry their guns, how high above the waterline, that was important. Another popular myth is that the shipwrights in this period could not determine the displacement of their vessels. And therefore they were cutting gun ports after they launched the ship. That's why the ships were uh, unstable, etc, etc, etc. This is mostly mythology because as far as early as Matthew Baker in the later 16th century, an idea how to measure displacement was already present. He offers, although does not actively elaborate on the method. Generally popularly believed uh, is that the first one to really develop the system further and establish displacement before building the vessel was Sir Anthony Dean in his Doctrine of 1670. That legend is mostly based on the writings of Samuel Pipps. Pipps is one of the most prolific and least reliable of sources that you can imagine for the 17th century. Very likable character because he, he is so human and he does not hide this in his diary. And that's why people tend to believe everything that he says as if it is gospel truth. It wasn't. Continuing along the same lines, we have already established our uh, depth in hold, our uh, with a floor timber, our maximum beam of the vessel. You take these measurements and you plot them on a piece. And you build up, in essence, a rectangular that is in size. The height of the rectangular is your depth in hold. The length of the rectangular is your beam. Within this space, at the bottom of this rectangular, and as I said, I probably will show you all this in practice in a future video, you mark the maximum width of the floor timber that you have designed up to the wrong heads of the design. There you draw two perpendiculars which connect the lower part of the rectangular to the upper part. And this is the framework within which, with the help of arcs of circles, with radii that are always a proportion of the beam or the depth in hold, and that the different methods specify how you come up with these uh, radii, you draw tangential arcs that shape the bottom part, the lower part of the hull. The upper part of the hull, the top works, uh, can be shaped either by reversing some of the curvatures of the lower, if you want to achieve an S-shaped top timber, or can be a simple straight line that leads from the curvature of the maximum beam of the frame to the top side of the vessel. This is more typical of the 16th century, and really disappears by the middle of the 17th century. Obviously, it is easier to 
assemble such straight lines, but it is less graceful and it was believed to give less strength to the vessel. How many arcs were employed is another interesting question, but that really depends on the system. Uh, Be uh, Matthew Baker was using up to five. He is showing some of his modes with five or even six separate arcs. But as the century progressed, as the period progressed, the numbers of different arcs used uh, slightly decreased in numbers. One of the easiest to follow uh, treatises, for example, was written by a shipwright called Edmund Bushnell. Edmund Bushnell wrote and published his treatise in 1659, although numerous versions of the treatise exist and continued being published into the early 18th century, despite being clearly dated by then. Uh, from our western shore of the Atlantic point of view, what is interesting about this treatise is that it was, uh, as he wrote in the introduction to the treatise, it was written specifically for the American, North American colonies. He pointed out that there is plentiful good quality timber available in uh, America. By this stage, 1659, there were enough carpenters who could put together a boat competently enough, but there were not enough shipwrights, trained shipwrights, who could design a vessel. So his treatise is essentially a cookbook. It is giving you a recipe for a ship, how to build this ship. And he believed that this is the most efficient, the best possible vessel for the American colonies of about 100 tons burden. His midship section, for example, is uh, consisting of only two arcs. It is very simple, it is very full, but because it is for a cargo vessel, essentially designed. In the 1670s, Dean used a minimum of three arcs. The turn of the bilge arc, the beam, the height of breadth arc, and the reconciling arc that shaped the fatics of the vessel. Once you have completed this design of this midship frame, you have to modify the midship frame to fit the, and to develop the sections along the rest of the vessel. There are a number of ways that you can accomplish this incremental modification. These in, uh, are controlled by the narrowing and rising lines. There are two sets of such lines. There is the lower rising and narrowing line, which shapes essentially your floor timbers. And then there is the height of breadth line, which is shaping the maximum beam of each of the vessels. Frames. How do you create these gradual fair curves is also an interesting question. And again, there are at least two good ways to do it. The one is more dominant in the Mediterranean traditions, and it is essentially a geometrical way by the use of mezzaluna, which is a half circle that is divided. The radii of the half circle is divided into the number of frames over which you have to modify the midship frame to reach the stern or the bow of the vessel. After you create a mezzaluna, you transfer this onto a measuring wooden stick. From there, you transfer the measurements to each and every one of the pieces of the frame by taking into account the narrower, the higher position that is dictated by this mezzaluna. In England, particularly, much more often you see arithmetics used for this purpose. That is where the logarithms come into play, in fact. But the, regardless whether you're doing it geometrically or you're doing it entirely by mathematics, the end result is pretty similar. It is telling you how much you have to move upwards above the keel, above your baseline, this already determined floor, timber, in order to create the rising, the narrowing, essentially, of the hull the sharpening of the hull towards the bow and the stern of the vessel. It also dictates, the narrowing line dictates how much you have to shorten it in order to fit into it. And creating these sections from exactly the same mode, the same uh, curvature, is at the end of the day providing you with the full shape of the vessel. 
The truth of the matter is that you don't really need to create a complete drawing of the vessel to build it. Once you have the midship frame, once you have established the narrowing and rising lines one way or another, and you have these proportions, all you have to do is mark it on the timbers and then transfer this shape and these markings onto the timber that you're going to cut to shape your vessel. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is hole molding. The system had to be modified over the years. Hole molding is brilliant. Contrary to what secondary literature is going to tell you, you can shape it all the way into the bow, even if it was not necessary. But it, theoretically, the system allows you to do it. The shortcoming of hole molding is that the pure unmodified version of it creates very sharp lines in the bow and in the stern of the vessel. But it became clear that actually you need much fuller lines in the bow to support all the weight of uh, chase guns, bowsprit and its associated uh, spars and rigging, the foremast, all of them were too far forward. So you actually need much fuller bow, uh, much more buoyancy to support such enormous weight. Add to this, of course, the anchors and you see what I mean. So modifications of uh, hole molding began fairly early on. And uh, by the beginning of the 18th century, this height of breadth actually was modified by stretching it with straight lines. And this method is described very well in this little book, The Shipbuilder's Assistant by Sutherland. This in is a very brief and crude overview of ship design in the early centuries. For in the future, I will create a video showing you the step-by-step -step process that will lead to an actual hull shape without the need of developing full set of drawings. Thank you ever so much for watching, bearing up with me over this long video. I really love having your comments and reading them when I get a chance. Thank you so much for liking, subscribing, commenting and as always thank you very very much for those of you who have been kind and generous enough to sponsor this channel thank you it is deeply appreciated i wish you a most wonderful rest of the day